Robert, are we, is the Conservative Party really going to be reduced to less than 100 seats? You have to take every poll with a pinch of salt because they're not polls at a general election. Um, there is a possibility that the Conservatives could be reduced to that level, uh, but equally they could be in a very different position. The poll treats everything on a national basis, uh, and there's a whole series of seats which are utterly improbable, the most obvious ones, which are Lib Dem seats, which are suggested will suddenly become Labour. Mm. Yeah, and the Lib Dems, of course, known for being quite vociferous local campaigners. Um, I'm Absolutely. Mm, I'm curious about the, the impact of reform, though, because both of the polls out this weekend showed basically that reform would cost the Conservatives about 50 seats. What do you make of that? Well, all these projections are done on the basis that there's a large number of 2019 Conservative voters who are currently undecided. They are allocated in part to reform, in part to Labour, and in part, they're allocated to people as people who still don't know, but are people who overwhelmingly normally vote. So the projections about reform are more up for question than almost any of the projections. Having said that, there is a level of volatility about the British electorate now that in all my years of politics and my analysis of opinion polls, I've never known. So it's reform are catching the public eye, Labour are doing well according to reallocation of, of undecided Conservatives, Greens could do very well. It's really difficult to project now what will happen at a general election. And what do you think is driving that volatility amongst the electorate? There's been a long-term decline in people's affiliation to one party or another. Uh, historically, people, they took the voting habits of their parents. That has progressively broken down over a number of decades. And we now have a number of alternatives, what I would describe as the disruptor parties, uh, and also the fact that Labour, in many opinion polls, are perceived by many voters as being a party of no change. And whereas previously people would have gone to the Liberal Democrats, they're now talking about going to other parties. So there's this range of different options at a point where people's loyalties have broken down. If I can just add one other thought about the opinion polls that have been published this weekend, the people within the Conservative Party who say they want a change of leader um, should look at a poll that showed that actually the vast majority of Conservative voters, the ones who are still committed to the Conservative Party, and even the uh, majority of voters in general, believe that Rishi Sunak should lead the Conservatives into the next general election. There's no evidence whatsoever that a change of leader will improve, and in most cases, would probably harm the Conservative Party's position. Let's talk about one of those core issues that does get brought up on the doorsteps, and that is illegal immigration. Obviously, we had the news this weekend that we've had more than 5,000 arrivals on small boats. You know, the government talks a tough game and has its legislation going sort of ping-ponging between the House of Lords and House of Commons at the moment. What do voters make of the main party's kind of record and rhetoric on illegal immigration? I think the, the parties... Uh, the, sorry, the public don't hold any of the parties in particularly high esteem in relation to immigration. You've got to remember that immigration is not the dominant issue in any opinion poll. What it matters to the vast majority of the public, not just in this country, but every major democracy, when they go to vote, is actually how they feel economically, whether that's described in the form of cost of living, unemployment, general feeling of economic welfare. So although a lot of attention is paid to immigration, that matters to a certain group of people, but it doesn't matter more than economic well-being. Do you anticipate seeing any electoral pacts, the sort of which we've seen before? Mainly, I suppose, between perhaps the Greens and Labour or and the Lib Dems? All the indications are that at the moment there will be no uh, uh, pacts. Uh, reform have said they won't do anything with the Conservative Party. 
uh, Greens and Lib Dems and Labour are making absolutely clear that they're fighting all the different constituencies across the country. There may be pacts in local government, and we'll see that in the nominations for May the 2nd's local elections. But at the national election, it's actually far less, uh, far less likely that there will be pacts. People will go head to head. And this is where the first past the post system works to the advantage of both the Conservative and Labour Party, because you could foresee the position, which we've had in Scotland on a number of occasions in recent elections, where people who've got very low percentages of the overall votes cast have actually gone on to win. And similarly, sometimes those parties that get quite a high percentage of votes cast win no seats. Do you anticipate that happening for reform? I do. I think it's likely to happen, not just for reform. Uh, the Lib Dems have constantly made that complaint about our electoral system, which is why they favour some form of proportional representation. Um, and it could happen to the Greens as well. So, yes, it is one of the vagaries of the first-past-the-post system. But when I was an MP, I was representative of part of Bristol, which wouldn't have got a voice had we had multi-member constituencies, for example. So there are benefits in all sorts of different ways to different electoral systems. But yeah, there will be some losers under the first-past-the-post system. Well, Lord Hayward, thank you there for your expert polling analysis as ever.